are with dangerous and deadly conditions in parts of the country and learning more about just how many people have been killed by this massive winter storm. Rescue crews just now getting to some places to clear snow and stranded cars with officials basically begging people to stay inside ahead of what could be one of the country's busiest travel days. We've got every angle covered live. Plus, police in Washington state tonight trying to figure out whether the vandalizing of some power substations was part of a coordinated attack that left thousands of people in the dark. What we're hearing now about that investigation. And with the U.S. in the middle of a mental health crisis, the Surgeon General tells me solving it is his top priority. Why he says this is so personal to him in an exclusive interview in tonight's original. Then a senior U.N. official pressuring the Taliban now to let women in Afghanistan go back to doing humanitarian work. How the new ban is keeping international aid groups from helping people in the middle of a crisis in that country. Plus, did you open a Christmas gift that you're just not vibing with? You're not alone. Since experts think millions of us are going to be returning billions of dollars worth of stuff. Our Brian Chung's posted up at a mall in New Jersey with some of the new huddles you may have to jump through to get your money back. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight we're learning that huge holiday storm is now responsible for the deaths of at least 57 people. 57 people. It is still scary and dangerous out there, with rescue crews in the Northeast focusing on clearing piles of snow that trapped people in their homes and cars. You've got the National Weather Service now warning of dangerously cold temperatures, along with intense wind chills. And that all might mean trouble for anybody still trying to fly this week. Forecasters say a lot of the eastern U.S. is going to be in a deep freeze throughout tonight. You see it there on the map. Temperatures are set to rebound tomorrow, but this storm has been deadly in 13 states, from Colorado to New York, where people killed have been found in their cars, even in snowbanks. And that was the case in western New York, a kind of ground zero for this winter catastrophe. Look at this. Look at some of these images you're seeing here, right? That is a house completely encased in snow. The New York governor calling this an all-hands-on-deck situation today. In Buffalo, you can see all the cars abandoned on the roads. People just left them. The area just paralyzed to the point where even some of the rescue crews needed rescuing. And then you've got some people apparently trying to take advantage of the situation. Look at this video of somebody breaking into a liquor store and robbing it right at the height of the storm on Christmas Eve. The Buffalo mayor saying... These people are the lowest of the low. Dasha Burns is joining us now from New York. Dasha, um, the number of people killed by the storm just in New York alone is up to more than two dozen, 27 people at least. There's still a driving ban. You cannot get out and drive on the road in some parts of the state, even though right now, right, the snow has stopped. People do need to get out. They've got to get their medication, go get to the doctor, whatever it is. Walk us through the landscape at this point. Well, Hallie, that's a tough balance to strike, right? People need to get out, but at the same time, there is really urgent work that needs to be done by these rescue workers, and that is why authorities are so serious about this travel ban. Now, there is a hotline you can call and let me underscore, it is for emergencies only. Emergencies, meaning if you need uh, urgent dialysis treatment, if you need life-saving medication, rescue workers can get that to you if you call uh, the hotline. But otherwise, uh, authorities are pleading in most of Erie County, especially that Buffalo area, to stay inside, stay off the roads, because there are still people trapped in cars, people that are uh, trapped in homes that really need uh, help urgently. And if people are on the roads, that's really hampering those efforts. Because because not only do you have folks driving around that shouldn't be, but you've got abandoned cars, like you mentioned. You have down power lines. You still have areas that are impassable. And you've got a lot of folks without power right now as well. And workers are trying to restore that power as quickly as possible, plowing the areas that need to be plowed, that uh, workers need to get access to. So there is a massive effort happening right now. But people really need to try to hunker down, again, unless you have one of those emergencies where you can call right. uh, the hotline in the Erie area, but otherwise, stay home. Let folks get that, that really urgent stuff done uh, and, and dig out from under this mess, Hallie. And you look at the scope of this storm, right, from the Great Lakes down to the border with Mexico across the East Coast, and right now you've yeah. got some 75,000 people who do not have power today when it's expected to be, again, dangerously, extremely cold tonight. That's problematic. 
Yeah, uh, below freezing temperatures all across the state of New York and many other parts of the country, too. You mentioned the scope. It's the scope plus the severity, right? I mean, we're talking about uh, Buffalo, New York, that they are no strangers to storms. are no strangers to lots and lots of no snow and freezing temperatures. But we are hearing over and over again that this storm is unlike anything they've ever seen. You talked about the border. Our, our colleagues were down there in El Paso reporting on the migrant situation where folks who didn't have anywhere to shelter during freezing temperatures. So the ripple effects of this, it, it, they're just impacting so many parts of the country that the scope and scale is, is just hard to wrap your mind around, Hallie. Dasha Burns, live for us there in New York. Dasha, thank you. You know, you talk about the impact of the weather, obviously, loss of life, number one thing. You've seen the pictures out of Buffalo, people still trying to play catch up, rescuers still, still trying to get out there. And then you pull back at the bigger landscape and the domino effect this has caused. Look at travel this week, right, with airlines playing catch up ahead of what experts think could be one of the worst travel days of the year tomorrow. Today alone, something like 3,600 flights have been canceled. That's as of right now, as we've been here in the studio. Let me bring in Shaq Brewster, who's at one of the very busy airports in Chicago at O'Hare. Um, Shaq, people are doing whatever they can to try to, at this point now, make their way home after the holidays. Yeah. Yeah, and they're finding a big struggle as they're trying to do that, Hallie. You mentioned the 3,700, approaching 3,700 cancellations, but across the country, you're also looking at about 6,000 delays at airports from coast to coast. And what we've learning in the past couple of hours are that many of them, a disproportionate share of those canceled flights coming from Southwest Airlines. Today, the carrier killing or scrapping 67% of their flights. Two out of every three scheduled Southwest West flights have been canceled for today. The airline blaming operational challenges and explaining it in this statement. I want to put that on the screen. This coming just this afternoon, they say we're working on we're working with safety at the forefront to urgently address wide scale disruption by rebalancing the airline and repositioning crews and our fleet ultimately to best serve all who plan to travel with us. They say and the CEO says in the statement that the delays and the cancellations that their travelers are experiencing are, quote, unacceptable. Now, separate from that, there are plenty of delays and cancellations happening at airlines across the country. We're seeing that here at O'Hare Airport yesterday. Two, uh, excuse me, one out of every three flights leaving O'Hare Airport were delayed. I want you to look or listen to what uh, some passengers told me as they were heading out and trying to head out to their destinations today. This is chaos. We just came up the elevator and I was very surprised. <laughs> How did you feel when you got that text saying your flight was canceled? Uh, very frustrated and upset. <laughs> and I got some strong words I can't say for TV. How are you still able to have that smile? What do you suggest people do? Just breathe. And the sun's going to come up tomorrow, so just got to let it go. <laughs> that is advice that applies for other situations as well. But the big tip, if you are going to uh, fly uh, this holiday season, folks are telling you to arrive early. We've heard it before. Give yourself extra time and really just be prepared to be patient once you get to that airport, Hallie. Okay, you've laid out, I think, well what the landscape might be like, um, the skyscape, if you will, if you're trying to fly somewhere. But about on the roads, right? Because there's supposed to be a ton of traffic tomorrow is and Wednesday as people try to get back, right, yeah. drive back from wherever they are. Yeah, there's not significantly better news or improved news when you look at the situation on the roads as well. Tomorrow, you have travel experts calling it the worst travel day of the year. That's because people are, they extended their holiday travel a little bit. They're going to be driving home. Uh, you can see busy roads tomorrow and Wednesday. The tip there is if you can, try to leave today. Try to leave this evening to avoid a lot of that congestion. If you can't, then try to wait at least until the back half of this week week, but you just get a sense, tally. while there hasn't been that record travel this season, you did see an increase, at least in the projected travel as we are coming in to this holiday week, and you're seeing the impacts of it both on by air and on the ground. Shaq Brewster, live for us there in Chicago. Shaq, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's take you out west now, where officials are looking for whoever attacked four substations in Washington state, knocking out power to something like 14,000 people. This attack, if you're thinking, well, wait a second, an attack on an electrical substation? Yeah, we saw several of them in North Carolina just a few weeks ago. Um, deliberate attack. Suspects shot at two substations there, cutting off power to tens of thousands of people for three days. Tom Costello is with us now. And Tom, 
First of all, where does this investigation stand? Do they know who did it or why? They don't. Uh, the sheriff's department there in Washington state is working with the FBI to try to figure this out. It's not the first, as you suggested. That's right. Not only in North Carolina, we've also had other instances in Oregon, in Washington state. There have been dozens of attacks on power stations around the country this year. The FBI earlier this month issued a warning in the Pacific Northwest, warning the Pacific Northwest that there were online threats, that there were likely to be more attacks on power stations. This is a problem nationwide, and it is now a top concern for for homeland security, they believe it could be domestic terrorism. How can some of these uh, power companies harden up infrastructure around substations? Like, in other words, well, what can be done to stop it? It costs money, right. and the trouble is, some of these substations that have been attacked are in rather right. remote locations. Right, they're out in the middle of nowhere. They're not in downtown Seattle, yeah. for example. That makes it a big challenge. Uh, listen, you can put up fencing, you can put the barbed wire on top, whatever, security guards. But what we have seen is that these attacks have involved firearms, mm. they've, they've involved cutting through the perimeter fencing as we had this time. There was a fire last night with, with very bright blue flame at one of these substations. So this is a, a very aggressive attempt to try to intimidate, uh, to try to attack these substations. It does seem like this writ large highlights the vulnerability of the power grid here in this country. Well, it absolutely is. And as to why, I, I've been talking to some uh, veteran law enforcement, uh, federal law enforcement officials today. What could possibly be the motivation for attacking substations? I mean, you know, you're, you're essentially cutting off the power right. to the people in your own neighborhood. Why do that? Well, there has been this domestic online threat and chatter all year, extends beyond this year, where people are being encouraged to do this. Their goal is to sow chaos, to sow discontent. And some of these people are extreme right-wingers. They are, in some cases, neo-Nazis. They're, in some cases anti-Semites, whatever the case may be, and they're trying to create social upheaval, thinking that, guess what, everybody will rise up against the establishment mm -hmm. and, bear, and grab their guns and fight the government. That's what they believe. That's what their motivation seems to be. The FBI and Homeland Security is all over it. We're going to be watching to see, obviously, what these folks in Washington State find out about this latest attack. Tom Costello, thank you very much. Thanks you for being on top of it. Appreciate it. Folks in Jackson, Mississippi, are under, again, a boil water advisory. Again, again. Right, they found out on Christmas Day with officials acknowledging in a statement, we know the timing is terrible. Now there's water distribution sites set up across Jackson with officials trying to restore pressure to the water system because of what they say are significant leaks and line breaks, probably because of all this cold weather. If you're thinking, wait a second, we just heard about water issues in Jackson, Mississippi. You are correct. There was a summer boil water advisory that lasted nearly seven weeks. That led to a Justice Department lawsuit and a federal investigation into whether Mississippi violated the Civil Rights Act. Blaine Alexander is joining us now. And Blaine, this is terrible news, right? I mean, it is terrible timing and terrible news for people in Jackson, especially because it could last for days. There's no easy fix here. And you know what? Officials are making it very clear that it's all hands on deck to try and restore service here. In fact, we reached out to the city today to try and speak to an official there to get the latest. And they said, quite frankly, all of their resources are focused on getting the water back on. They didn't have anybody to spare to talk to us on camera because basically everybody's trying to fix this problem. You know, this is something that the mayor warned several days ago could likely happen. He said that because the cold temperatures are coming, because their pipes are already taxed and already aging, we would likely see cracks in the system. And that's that's exactly what happened. So two issues, yes, a boil water adv advisory, but also for a good number of people, there just isn't any water at all. I spoke with one woman, uh, Katisha Bragg, today, and she told me that she, on Christmas Eve, turned on her water faucet, had nothing come out. She couldn't make Christmas dinner. She spent a good deal of her time today standing in line, waiting in line to get bottled water. But get this, Hallie, this is the fifth time this year that she's been in this situation. It's the fifth time that she's seen water completely go out. Uh, and she says that, you know, she's had to really kind of change things around and, and try and deal with this. But I hear that, Blaine, and I hear that this, this family has been through this five times this calendar year alone. And the question comes up for me, how is it possible that this is happening again? Jackson is the biggest city in Mississippi. It's not like nobody was paying attention to it before today. This has been on the national radar, on the White House's radar, on the president of the United States's radar. How is it possible that it's, it's this bad? 
And that's a question that a lot of people are asking and very frustrated about, Holly. This is an infrastructure issue, officials say, a deep-seated infrastructure issue that's really spanned back decades. This is something that's been going on for quite some time now. Now, for the people there, there is a, a glimmer of hope in some of the people that I spoke to in the fact that Congress just approved some $600 million uh, as part of the, the federal spending bill that's going to go towards shoring up the infrastructure. But officials there say that any sort of meaningful change is likely going to take years. And at least one official says that it will likely take more money even than that $600 million. So yes, there are some patches coming, but still meaningful change is a little bit away. It was away. And I don't think that we can overemphasize, Hallie, just what it means for people there on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a city where more than a quarter of the residents live below the poverty line. So when you're talking about taking away water, you mean that means they can't wash clothes, uh, they can't uh, use their restrooms, they can't cook. So that means added expenditures, going to laundromats, things like that, and things that people tell me they simply can't afford to do repeatedly, Hallie. Blaine Alexander, live for us on this story. Blaine, thanks for being on top of it for us. Appreciate it. Speaking of the White House, you've got the White House today blasting the governor of Texas for what the Biden administration calls a cruel, dangerous, and shameful stunt. They're talking about more than 100 migrants being bused from Texas to here in D.C., dropped off outside the home of Vice President Kamala Harris. Happened on Christmas Eve, in the middle of that winter storm we've been talking about, one of the coldest nights of the year here in Washington, with some folks wearing only T-shirts. It comes as hundreds of migrants are sleeping on the streets of El Paso in freezing conditions, waiting for this big Supreme Court decision to drop on Title 42 and the future of immigration policy. Josh Letterman joins us live now. Um, and Josh, we talk about Title 42. It is actually a public health policy, right? It was implemented under the former president as a COVID measure, if you will. The question mark is, what is the Supreme Court going to do about it now? I know you can't answer that piece of the question, but what's the White House's plan when this decision does drop? Well, and just to kind of capture for people how uh, totally ridiculous this situation has gotten, mm. uh, pretty much everyone acknowledges at this point uh, that Title 42 is now being used as an immigration policy instead of a public right. health policy, that the underlying uh, COVID infection reasons for telling people who might have viable asylum claims, sorry, you got to go back over the border anyway, and that those conditions no longer exist. But our system is so broken uh, that Democrats, frankly, along with Republicans, have been willing to extend that policy for some time because there seemed to be no other option to deal with this influx of migrants. Now the Supreme Court uh, likely poised at some point to lift this policy. Uh, the administration is encouraging them to, in fact, lift the policy, although they want a couple of days of transition time. And the question is, what can the federal government do to really surge resources to the border? The White House says that the Homeland Security Department is doing exactly that. They also say that the State Department is actively coordinating with some of the countries whose uh, citizens, whose residents are the ones who are coming over the border to the United States to try to deal with this problem uh, at the the origin. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I don't think anybody is pretending. Uh, certainly, White House officials acknowledge that there is going to be a surge after Title 42 goes away and that it is not something that the federal government at this point uh, is able to deal with because the system is just frankly broken. Democrats say it. Republicans say it. Nobody has been able to actually find a solution that they could get through Congress and actually fix this problem legislatively, which is what uh, everybody says uh, is is what needs to happen. But in the meantime, the administration is asking for at least $3 billion more from Congress to try to get more boots on the ground, so to speak, in those border states to deal with this influx. Josh Letterman, alive for us there on the White House North Lawn. Josh, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. South Korea on high alert today, firing warning shots, launching fighter jets and attack helicopters after yet another provocation by North Korea. This one, something we haven't seen in like five years. North Korea put drones into South Korean airspace. Today, you saw the South responding with some surveillance of its own, sending assets, quote unquote, assets, right, meaning equipment near their border with North Korea to take pictures of North Korean facilities. The South's military says the five North Korean drones did not hit any infrastructure in cities where people are living. But one of these drones apparently got so far, it actually got into Seoul, the capital of South Korea. That is decently far into South Korea, right? This is as North Korea keeps on stepping up this provocation situation here. They have missile tested. Kim Jong-un is often launching multiple weapons at a time, something that a lot of folks are watching really closely at this point.
As we look at international developments, we're also seeing just this afternoon a significant one out of Ukraine and Russia. The Ukrainian foreign minister looking for a peace summit in February, preferably at the U.N., possibly mediated by the U.N. Secretary General, according to a new interview with the Associated Press. The foreign minister says the summit could happen around the anniversary of the war. And when it comes to whether Russia would be invited, Ukraine says yes, but only after they've been prosecuted for war crimes. The announcement comes just a day after Russian President Vladimir Putin himself said he might be willing to negotiate over this war that he has waged on Ukraine. Take that with a big grain of salt, okay? Because U.S. officials are. They're pretty skeptical of comments like this. They say Russia has given no sign that they're actually ready to negotiate in good faith. Matt Bradley is joining us now. And Matt, let's talk about what the Ukrainian foreign minister is saying, right? Because they say they'll do whatever it takes to win this war, but that at the end of the day, every war ends diplomatically. This, this word, diplomacy, right? The idea of diplomatic talks. It is, it is not always one that has been embraced um, throughout the course of this invasion. Talk us through it. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, it has been embraced. There were diplomatic talks at the beginning, but you're talking about that AP article, and I got to tell you, Holly, I was confused when I read it because when you go down to the bottom, then you see that suddenly, okay, we are going to have this peace conference, but Russia will only be invited if they submit to you right. know, war crimes trials. That's not exactly. That's kind of an asterisk, some small print that I don't think Moscow is really going to want to adhere to. So it kind of makes it seem like all of this talk of negotiations, and we're hearing that from both sides, as you mentioned, Vladimir Putin and from you know uh, Ukraine here. It kind of makes it sound like they're sort of talking past each other. Because here's the deal, Hallie, the Ukrainians do feel like they're winning. They, they believe they're winning and they have the battlefield bona fides to prove it. So the fact is, if you're winning, it makes it hard to want to negotiate a truce, especially if that could possibly mean you might have to yield some ground to Russia. But this is kind of my point, Matt, on the diplomatic piece of it, right? Because when I say that diplomacy was a bit of um, like a, a little bit of a, of a grenade, sure, we saw those talks in the beginning, but like even a month ago, right, the idea that Western nations would talk about diplomacy was seen, I think, in some corners as a sign that perhaps the West was retreating from support from Ukraine, which was not the case and not the message that the West wanted to send. Yeah, I think and you're referring to that letter that was sent by all of those left wing Democrats. They said, you know, Biden should be pushing Ukraine to negotiate. And then they actually retracted that letter because, the, you know, the, the anger about that was just so scathing. So they learned that they shouldn't talk about negotiations. And here in Ukraine, negotiation is the longest four letter word around. I mean, you can't talk about that because negotiation here rhymes with capitulation. And that's why nobody wants to talk about right. that, because to negotiate means to yield to the aggressor. That's how it's seen here in Kyiv. That's how it's seen throughout Ukraine. And, you know, justifiably so. It, it all started back in the 90s, back when Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons, basically, to appease Moscow. Uh, and ever since then, it's been seen as if you're negotiating, you're giving something up. And Vladimir Putin, at least here in Kyiv, the perception is, and actually throughout the entire region, the perception is that Vladimir Putin pursues maximalist goals. And he's not going to yield. If you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. You talk about the landscape on the battlefield, right? And look at the other big headline today on this issue, because Russia says three of its Air Force personnel were killed after this Ukrainian drone was shot down at an air base. Um, and we're showing the map here fairly far inside Russian territory. Talk us through that. Yeah. I mean, this is not the first time. This is the second time that's happened in a month. And actually, the Ukrainians have done pretty well at targeting places inside Russia proper. And it looks like they're going to continue, especially if they keep edging toward the border. They're going to be in greater range and be able to hit more and more targets. That's one of the reasons why I don't think Belarus, despite Vladimir Putin's encouragement, why Belarus probably doesn't want to involve themselves any further into the war. They don't want to be facing a lot of attacks from Ukraine. And the fact is, is that this is embarrassing to Moscow. They keep doing this. And you see excerpts from Russian state TV. People get up there, these sort of talking heads on Russian state TV. They're paid to be patriotic. And they're bemoaning this. They're humiliated by it. Because really, they see this as not only Ukraine being able to hold off what should have been a superior Russian force, but being able to leapfrog over that superior Russian force and attack within Russia. So this is something that a lot of Russians see as humiliating, and it's humiliating for the Ministry of Defense. 
because of course they're the ones who are on the top of this. They're the ones who are leading the charge. And they've been getting a lot of criticism from even the most patriotic nationalistic Russians. A massive avalanche basically swallowing skiers in Austria. All of it caught on camera. We're gonna show that to you coming up in the five things in a minute. But first on the opioid epidemic, the FDA is fast tracking their review of overdose reversing drugs to make them more widely available, something that advocates say would be a huge step forward in trying to combat the opioid crisis. If, in fact, the FDA does this, the nonprofit Harm Reduction Therapeutics would be allowed to sell its nasal spray over the counter by late April. This is part of a bigger push by the FDA, encouraging companies to apply for this like fast-tracked review. Another overdose reversing nasal spray was given similar approval earlier this month. This all comes at a critical point of this opioid epidemic. Illegal fentanyl is now the leading cause of death for people in the U.S. from ages 18 to 49, the leading cause of death, according to this Washington Post investigation. The problem is widespread. The DEA has reports of sharp nationwide spikes in how deadly some of these fentanyl-laced fake pills actually are. Six out of 10 of these fake pills are testing at potentially lethal levels. That is why this kind of over-the-counter nasal spray could be so important. You could have it in your medicine cabinet, have it in your purse, and be able to potentially save a life just by having it on you. So tonight's original now. With in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching, the U.S. is in the middle of a mental health crisis, as you probably know. And teens, they're affected in a big way. In 2021, nearly 40% of high schoolers reported having poor mental health in the previous year, according to the CDC. But there is some hope. In an NBC News exclusive, I sat down with the Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Morthy, who has made mental health a top priority. We talked about an after-school program in Chicago that could be a model for other schools nationwide. For high schoolers in Chicago, a different kind of class. This after-school program centering on the mental health of teens. What a lot of people do is they cover it up. Latrell Scott, who's 17, says adults sometimes don't get it. In my experience as a teenager, it, they have quite literally shunned me, like shunned my emotional state sometimes, and it's taken a lot of work to actually learn how to speak and be honest and open with myself. Nearly half of high schoolers have reported feeling persistently sad or hopeless in the past year. Startling statistics that only begin to illuminate how deep the teen mental health crisis is in this country. It's why programs like this one exist, a partnership between Adler University and After School Matters, intended to help students connect with therapists and get access to behavioral health services. The teens now are so much braver. Um, I think they are demonstrating more openness to talk about their mental health. The nation's top doctor visiting to see for himself earlier this month. Mental health is the defining public health challenge of our time. Should there be more investment in programs like these then? Is that the answer? Well, it's part of the answer. And yes, there should be more investment there because when kids do better, it doesn't just benefit their mental health. It doesn't just reduce uh, chances of anxiety and depression. But it also improves how they perform in school. It improves how they show up for their family and their friends. For Dr. Vivek Morthy, like for so many of us, it's deeply personal. In my own life as a child, I struggled a lot uh, with my mental health. I you know, felt lonely at times. I struggled with anxiety. But I didn't know who to talk to about it. I felt this real sense of shame. And I look at my own children now, who are four and six, and I don't want them to go through what I went through. I want them to to know that if they need help, that it's okay to ask for help. The Surgeon General sounding the alarm, issuing a rare public health advisory about the youth mental health crisis, and he's been working to elevate the conversation. Just talking about it can be part of the solution, right? Raising the visibility, putting a spotlight on this matters. It absolutely does. And we know that, you know, we've got to change culture by, by having better conversations, more open conversations about mental health. Conversations like the ones happening in Chicago, where nearly eight in 10 students who participated said they feel more hopeful about their future. If I want my life to get any better, then what can I start doing? Like 14-year-old Claudine Agassana. If I'm really feeling down and I need someone to talk to, I have to go and talk to someone to make myself better. More conversations mean stronger connections, mean better health. It's not just school, right? For those teens, that's where they spend so much of their time, and that's the focus here. But what about for adults, right? It's the workplace. And that is why the Surgeon General has also issued a warning about the dangers of toxic workplaces to all of our health. Listen to that piece of our conversation. 
there's a real risk that we are not supported by our jobs, that, mm. that, that, that careers are driving the burnout problem in this country. Talk a little bit about that and about mm. how this came to be on your radar. Well, it's undeniable that workplaces have an impact on our mental health. You know, if you're working full time, you're spending nearly half of your time at work and the nature of your work, the environment at work, the people you're interacting with, those do impact our overall mental health and well-being. The data is very clear on that. How do you do it? If you don't mind me asking, you were a surgeon general, you, and you know this job, you know this role, it's stressful. Mm -hmm. You decided to sign up for another, <laughs> another go at it. How do you take care of your own mental health in a job like yours, where you're dealing not only with this mental health crisis, this epidemic, mm -hmm. as you've described it in this country, but what we're seeing now, COVID, flu, mm -hmm. the triple-demic, all sorts of things on your plate here. Well, you know, like all people, I'm a, a work in progress, you know, and I'm learning as I go. Um, but part of what I'm learning from is my experience as surgeon general the first time where I, to be honest with you, did not do a great job mm -hmm. uh, taking care of my mental health and well-being. Uh, I invested everything into the job, but I neglected my relationships, my family and my friends. Uh, I was not doing the things I needed to do to take care of my own body in terms of physical activity and working out. This time, I had a conversation with my wife, uh, who is the one who keeps me accountable in life. Always a good uh, move, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she asked me, she said, what's going to be different mm -hmm. uh, this time around? And we made some decisions, you know, about what we would do differently. For more resources, head to hhs.gov slash Surgeon General. Lots of stuff there. Um, again, we talk about it all the time on the show. Mental health matters. It's important. Talk about it. Take care of it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, China is putting a stop to some COVID quarantine rules for people coming into the country starting in just a couple weeks, January 8th. Right now, everybody who travels to China has to quarantine for five days at this government-supervised facility and then three more days at home. This is a major step for the country to, to stop doing that. Its borders have mostly been closed since 2020. Number two, Kathy Whitworth, one of the greatest golfers of all time, died on Christmas Eve at 83 years old. She won 88 LPGA victories. That is more than any player on any pro tour. For context, that is six more than Tiger Woods. She was also the first woman to earn a million dollars in her golf career. She will be missed. Number three, 10 skiers who are missing after an avalanche on Christmas in Western Austria have been incredibly found alive, according to the Austrian press agency. Four people were hurt. Here's what happened. First responders used cell phone video from a witness, which seems to show 10 more skiers in the avalanche's path. It turns out they escaped and skied down the mountain. Police say everybody has been accounted for at this point. Number four, the Denver Broncos. Firing rookie head coach Nathaniel Hackett before the end of his first season. He coached just 15 games with the team. Four and 11 was the record there. The Broncos were expected to make the playoffs after getting Super Bowl champion quarterback Russell Wilson in a trade off season. After a blowout loss Christmas Day, the Broncos owner and GM decided to let go of Hackett with two games left on the schedule. Number five, Mega Millions jackpot, no winners. So the opportunity still persists for you to win half a billion dollars if you would like to. It's the sixth biggest prize in the 20 year history of the game. The odds only one in 302 million. The next drawing is tomorrow. I don't know, man, are you feeling lucky? Back now to Buffalo and that historic winter storm that has caused so much destruction that has turned deadly now, killing dozens of people. The New York governor, we're learning, talked with President Biden today. She tweeted this photo not too long ago, thanking the president for promising to approve a federal disaster declaration that would send money and other resources to some of these really, really hard hit communities as they start digging out. And look, that process is going to take a while especially because we're not done yet. The National Weather Service says lake effect snow will keep up even through tomorrow in some spots. Buffalo could get hit with even another foot, potentially. It's also going to stay super, super cold. The assistant managing editor of the Buffalo News, a local news outlet, may have put it best in this tweet. Quote, dear God, enough already. Sincerely, Buffalo. With me now, Bruce Andretch of the Buffalo News. Um, Bruce, thank you so much for being with us. As you are, I know, working with your team of incredible reporters and photojournalists to cover the storm. How are you holding up, first of all? Um, we're okay. Our, uh, our reporters, luckily, given the age we live in, are able to cover this largely remotely. It's been almost impossible to go out into the storm to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Our photographers have done that a bit, but um, reporters have been working far longer and far uh, even harder, if that's possible, to try to stay on top of this story. There's so many elements to it. Um, it's uh, It's been a struggle. 
How do you keep people safe, right? Because you don't want to add to the burden that rescue workers have to deal with by having people who go out covering this end up being part of the story itself, right? That said, there's also obviously the mission of accountability and accuracy and keeping people up to date with this reporting. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, our, our elected officials locally have been holding regular briefings and have been uh, answering all the questions we've asked about uh, what the latest, what the response is, um, how long this is going to last, what what more needs to happen. Uh, but yeah, job one for everyone in Western New York right now is to try to try to stay safe. We can't, in good conscience, send reporters out to to the scenes where this has been uh, just a nightmare when we know that plow drivers, police officers, firefighters, right. ambulance drivers can't get out to the scene. So we're doing a lot of this the way that you and I are talking, and uh, it's been effective. You know, I'm struck by a quote that I read, um, I think it was in another New York paper, somebody calling this the Darth Vader of storms for Buffalo, right? Because Buffalo is used to winter, you are used to snow there, but this is epic, right? This is on another level, and I imagine it might be similar to you, you tell me, feel similar to the blizzard of 1977, another historic storm that you lived through and that you covered. If you had asked me last week uh, about the, the blizzard that we knew was coming, would it be worse than the blizzard of 77? I think anyone who was raised in Western New York would tell you that that was the, the storm by which all other storms are judged and we would never see anything like that again. Um, as I told many people over the weekend, I was wrong. This this is worse wow. on so many, uh, so many levels. We already have uh, a higher loss of life in, um, in Western New York and Erie County than we had during the blizzard of 77. And that should tell you something, given the, the precision of the weather forecast we had, we had days to prepare for this. The blizzard of 77, to some extent, was uh, a surprise. Uh, we knew this was coming. We were as prepared as we thought we could be. But as our county executive and our governor said today, there's only so much you can do in the face of what was thrown at us uh, over the last several days. That's right. And one of the things that has also struck me is the, is the stories that we are seeing of resilience and of communities coming together, people coming together. The Times, the New York Times had a piece on a family in Buffalo who had a bus full of South Korean tourists break down in front of their home. They, they housed them for three days. They were sleeping on couches and in sleeping bags. You're reporting on a woman who gave birth in the middle of the blizzard before emergency crews could get to her. Her husband basically got to a stranger on Facebook to, to try to get through us here. I mean, th those are the stories that, are, that I think are also worth noting. We, we take great pride in our, our nickname as the city of good neighbors, as I'm sure other communities yeah. do. But uh, it's at times like this where you realize that the, the only way to survive, the only way to make it through this is to help everybody as much as you can. It's, as I said, it's a struggle. We, we really can't get out of our neighborhoods. We just now, just today, um, communities started lifting the driving bans that had been in effect since Friday in some cases. So uh, it's, it's a problem, but I just saw some Something else on social media a little while ago about uh, a family that needed to get off their street for a medical emergency. All the neighbors got together and shoveled out the street, shoveled in and uh, plowed out the streets. So wow. uh, thankfully, there are many, many stories like that, all of which we're trying to tell. Good neighbors, indeed, uh, and a good paper to be able to tell them. We are big fans of local news here. Bruce Andretch, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate you coming thank on. You Thanks. Too. Good luck to you. A lot of people thinking of Bruce and people in his community this afternoon. So. It is the day after Christmas, right? And maybe you are heading back to the mall. Good luck to you to return some of those gifts. And no shame in that, because do you really need another one of the things that you inevitably got, right? Turns out a lot of us are probably heading back to return stuff. 18%, right? So basically, one in every five gifts that we got is going back to the store. Amazon, Macy's, Walmart, the big stores, they let people do return gifts as late as the end of January, so it gives you some time to make up your mind. But there's also some places, like Amazon or Best Buy, that have shortened their return windows this year. Some new caveats in place. You might want to look at the fine print, because you don't want to get stuck with whatever it is that you have extra of this year. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung is at Garden State Plaza in New Jersey for us. Whether it's 10 pairs of socks or an extra waffle maker, like whatever it is, Brian, people are trying to get rid of it. Um, I assume that is what you're seeing as you are now lucky you at a mall in Jersey. I couldn't have <laughs> pitched it any better for you on the day after Christmas. 
<laughs> Thanks so much, Al. I mean, yes, it's very busy here at the mall because a lot of people, as you mentioned, are doing exactly what you said, trying to return the gifts that they just unopened yesterday. Now, for what it's worth, we saw lots of lines on Black Friday for people trying to purchase. Now there are lines outside many of these stores just to go out and return. The statistic is at $171 billion. That's the estimate for how much in merchandise is going to be returned this holiday shopping season. But as you mentioned, with a lot of the policies for returns getting a little bit more stringent, I asked a lot of people who I found here at the mall today whether or not it got harder. Take a listen. It's easier to buy online and then return in store because then if you see something else, you can exchange it for something you want. Did you have any issues returning it? Or? No, it was actually really easy. Definitely return policy have uh, changed a lot because a lot of people, a lot of people abuse it and uh, I think a lot of stores, they change it, but uh, but like I said, before I purchase something, I always make sure with my return policies. Are. It's really important to note two dates, the date that you bought something when returning it and the date by which the deadline is to return that item. A lot of retailers have extended holiday shopping windows, but the period by which an item is eligible for a holiday level return is dependent on where you're shopping at Amazon and Best Buy. They actually shortened that window this year. Something really important to note as you go out and try to return some stuff that you bought this holiday season. The question that I'm sure the adorable little girl in overall, overalls behind you wants to know um, is she, she can't stop staring at the camera, which is too cute, is about, about the, there she is, <laughs> it's about the, uh, I'm sure she'll want about the broader economic picture come 2023, right? In other words, what does this holiday shopping season tell us about what we can expect as far as an economic snapshot into next year, um, given the fact that there are concerns about the inevitability of a recession, et cetera? Can we read anything into some of these numbers? Yeah, for sure. I mean, kids have been asking me all day about the recession, of course. Yeah. No, I mean, what we're hearing, though, is certainly some consternation about what the picture is going to look like next year. It's really interesting because when you take a look at overall retail sales, we got figures from a MasterCard just this morning showing that spending from November 1st to December 25th was about 8% if you round up higher than uh, last year. But if inflation is higher, of course, that means essentially it's a wash. So people being very cautious as they consume and spend this holiday season. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Good to see you. Enjoy the mall. Um, stop by and get <laughs> a soft pretzel. Thank you. Afghanistan's humanitarian crisis could go from bad to worse, with some big NGOs saying they're not going to work there anymore, since the Taliban said women can no longer work at NGOs in the country. So these four nonprofit organizations you see here, including Save the Children and the International Rescue Committee, have officially stopped operations in Afghanistan. And listen, women are critical to the way that these organizations run. More than 3,000 members of the IRC staff in Afghanistan, for example, are women. U.S. officials, including the Secretary of State, are slamming this move, especially because it's coming just days after they also banned female students from going to universities across the country. That triggered some big backlash in Afghan cities and overseas. NBC's Ali Arouzi has more. Hey, Hallie. Well, it's been another bad day for the women of Afghanistan as the Taliban introduces the latest curb in a string of curbs that uh, affect women's human rights and opportunities in Afghanistan. Rights and opportunities that have been fast dwindling since the Taliban took control last year. Now, this latest action, which is essentially state-sponsored misogyny, bans women from working with NGOs, non-government organizations. And the result of that has been that these NGOs have now suspended their operations in Afghanistan, amongst them Save the Children, the International Rescue Committee, uh, the Norwegian Refugee Committee, and CARE all say that they can no longer effectively work in Afghanistan without women who play a pivotal role in their workforce. It's women that help them gain access to desperate women much of the time in far-flung parts of the country, not least of all because of cultural sensitivities. And it's over the last months, women have been essential in reaching millions of other desperate women all over the country. Just to put it in some numbers for you, the NRC uh, has 500 women working for them. That's a third of their workforce. The IRC employs 3,000 women, and the Taliban have just taken them out of the workforce with little regard for people's situations. Now, NGOs 
provide a very important service, healthcare, education, child protection, nutritional services and, and support in one of the world's most isolated countries that has a plummeting humanitarian crisis going on. Now, the move has been criticised by the US. That seems to have had little effect on the Taliban. And of course, this follows a move by the Taliban who banned women recently from uh, attending secondary school and universities. They also placed a ban on them entering public spaces like gyms and parks. Now, they said that they were going to be a very different Taliban of the 90s. They were going to be a new Taliban, more open to women's rights. But that clearly isn't the case. Ali? Our thanks to Ali Aruzi for that reporting. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Western Bureau, a woman slipped on ice while on a hike in California. She fell something like 200 feet over the weekend. Another hiker found her and activated like this garment he was wearing to get help. A helicopter crew flew nearby, dropped off a rescuer to get her airlifted. The woman was then taken to a hospital for further evaluation and treatment. Also from our Western Bureau, a 19-year-old in California was arrested for giving out fake parking tickets near the beach by Santa Cruz. This teenager was charged with unlawful use of a computer system and attempted fraud. The fake tickets had a QR code on them that directed people to a website to pay, police say, but they're not sure how many tickets were given out or if anybody actually did go on and, and pay that. From our Northeast Bureau, rapper Meek Mills has paid bail for 20 women incarcerated in Philadelphia who were not able to afford it, according to Reform Alliance, an organization he launched in 2019 with Jay-Z. In an Instagram post, Meek Mills said it was devastating to be away from his son during the holidays when he was incarcerated, so he understands what these women and families are going through. Each woman will also receive a gift card to buy groceries or holiday gifts. Typically, the holiday season, right, the week that we're in right now is supposed to be a big one for Hollywood, and this year is no exception with some big new releases. The Avatar sequel, The Way of Water, from James Cameron. Damien Chazelle's showbiz epic, Babylon. DreamWorks, animated Puss in Boots. And Sony's out with its Whitney Houston biopic, I Want to Dance with Somebody. This, you know, all of it's supposed to fill up theaters, but this nasty winter storm we've been talking about seemed to keep people at home. Combine that with the potential for more COVID when people are indoors and with family over the holidays, concerns about the flu and RSV, and it looks like what you're left with are empty theater seats. But even under these conditions, Avatar did manage to break ground. It brought in $90 million over the holiday weekend. Right now, bringing its total to something like $287 million. Around the world, it's like nine, nearly 900 million, almost a billion. It's a ways to go from the first Avatar record, which was nearly triple that at $3 billion. So if you look beyond the box office, though, there were a lot of entertainment headlines this year. I'm sure you remember all of them. I am sure you remember at least one of them, okay, that slap heard around the world at the Oscars. We saw the drama keep up with that heated defamation trial, some very troubling behavior, and, of course, some anger toward Ticketmaster. NBC's Joe Fryer takes us down memory lane. The year began with a bang, or more specifically, a slap. Actor Will Smith stormed the Oscars stage in March, hitting Chris Rock in the face after the comedian made a joke about Smith's wife, Jada. The ugly incident overshadowing Smith's Best Actor win just moments later. He was later banned from the Oscars for 10 years and posted a lengthy apology. Chris, I apologize to you. No such apologies were issued after the closely watched defamation trial between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. The divorce stars spent weeks in court accusing each other of disturbing incidents of domestic abuse. He just hit me over and over and over again. I've never struck a woman in my life. Both were ultimately found liable for defamation against each other, with the jury awarding significantly more damages to Depp. Heard appealed the decision, but settled this month. And then there was the year in Ye, rapper formerly known as Kanye West. Early in 2022, he launched an Instagram campaign against comedian Pete Davidson, who was dating his ex-wife, Kim Kardashian. He then stunned observers by wearing a White Lives Matter t-shirt during Paris Fashion Week, but it was anti-Semitic comments made later in the year that sparked even more backlash, losing Ye lucrative partnership deals, including Adidas. 
Taylor Swift had some bad blood, and this time it wasn't with Ye, but with Ticketmaster. High demand for the pop star's upcoming tour led to a botched pre-sale with error messages, long waits, and outrageous prices. I am really upset with Ticketmaster today. I didn't get tickets to the Taylor Swift concert. Ticketmaster later apologized, saying demand for tickets reached 3.5 billion system requests, a record on its site. Tom Brady is now sporting one less ring, his wedding ring. The football goat and supermodel Giselle Bündchen finalized their divorce in October after 13 years of marriage. It was a rocky year for the couple after Brady returned to the football field following a short 40-day retirement. For all the negative entertainment news of 2022, there was one hopeful note for celebrity watchers and romantics, the return of Benifer. I'm engaged! In April, Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck announced they were finally going to be married nearly two decades after their first engagement was called off. Jennifer walked down the aisle not once, but twice, proving that yesterday's headlines could be tomorrow's hope for Hollywood. Our thanks to Joe Fryer for that look back. That does it for this hour. We will look ahead to tomorrow and see you here, same time, same place. Glad to be with you. Have a great holiday Monday. More coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.